and welcome to our weekly webinar session. This week we are featuring um, one of the most amazing places in Australia, uh, Kangaroo Island, obviously being a South Australian based um, company, my business, so it's a huge footprint uh, on my heart and a wonderful place to visit. I would like to start by uh, doing an acknowledgement to country, so I'd like to pay uh, respects to First Nations people, past, present and emerging across our beautiful country of Australia. Um, I am quite familiar with the Naranjeri people um, and Kangaroo Island for them is the resting place of their um, creation ancestor Narundri from the stories I've been told by the elders of the Naranjeri people. So it holds a significant uh, place in the Naranjeri story of the creation of the Murray River running down through the Flurio Peninsula and across to Kangaroo Island. So um, we like to acknowledge all of our uh, First Nations people. Um, you'll note uh, all of our listeners are uh, muted, but we do want to hear from you. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, so please type your questions in there and we'll be sure to answer them as we go. Uh, any that we don't get to, we'll ensure we follow up and answer after the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our fabulous guests for today. We have the exceptional Craig Wickham from Exceptional Kangaroo Island. Hi, Craig, and welcome. Thank and you. we have Peggy and Mike from the Pelican Lagoon Research and Wildlife Centre. And Good day. The founder of Wild Diaries. So, welcome everyone. Great to have you all on board. Um, and I love seeing Craig's the kangaroos and things hopping around behind him. So, don't let that distract you, everyone. <laughs> but it's uh, incredible te technology and how we've all become very efficient with using Zoom in the last few weeks. Um, Craig, let's start with you. We've just 30 years of doing tourism. Why tourism? I grew up in, uh, in a business family on Kangaroo Island. So, uh, I guess it was uh, it was in my blood, but uh, you know, being surrounded by nature, open spaces, you know, whether the, the bush out the back or the ocean out the front, uh, I, and working with parks, I sort of had a both a an immersion in it from from a childhood, but then professional interest in in wildlife conservation and nature, and then I've been uh, I've been doing this for uh, a very long time and. It's, it's really provided a great vehicle for us to celebrate the best that the island offers. So, you know, some of the changes over the, the, you know, the past uh, you know, 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of diversification going on with, with farmland. There's been emergence of a, a, a beautiful art scene on the island. And uh, we really have the opportunity to bring all that together in a really efficient way for visitors to share. So... My job's really just to share the best that the, uh, the place offers. Fantastic. That's a wonderful answer. Uh, Peggy, I, you're involved in research with wildlife and marine life on the island. Why is KI such a special and unique location to undertake this style of research? Well, first of all, we have great habitat here. And primarily, I'd say, you know, the island is really special because we have no rabbit. We have no foxes, we have no deer, we have no feral goats. So we have a really intact environment that the ecosystems have evolved um, without the sort of pressures that's been on the mainland. So here on Kangaroo Island, we see plant and animal interaction much as it was pre-European time. And that makes it really, really special for long-term research. So I've been here for 30 years doing research and Mike's been here for like 50 years now being, doing, doing research. So yeah, so we have specialties. His might be you know, penguins and birds and, and we work together, of course, with echidnas and goannas, but we're interested in all the wildlife and we've been collecting data uh, through all kinds of unique ecosystems and creatures here. Fantastic. And I noted, I did uh, in my pre-reading notice that feral cats, are they an issue on the island? Cause like they are on the mainland? Yes, unfortunately, feral cats are one of the biggest uh, predator and a big predator problem, especially after the fires. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we hope we're getting on top of it. I've been on a feral cat steering committee and a kangaroo and cat control committee for the last 30 years. <laughs> it's an ongoing problem of a long term. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Craig, I think probably maybe if we just touch on how uh, we access Kangaroo Island for those that are maybe from overseas that are listening and the best uh, way to get, get to KI. So we've got a couple of choices, either uh, flying in from Adelaide. There has been a bit of a dabble with flying direct flights, Melbourne uh, to Kingscote direct with uh, Qantas Link, but that's been for a relatively short season. And with all the uncertainty with aviation at the moment and, uh, you know, 
closed borders. Uh, obviously, that's a that's a bit of a question mark. Uh, but certainly, from there's there's regular off, uh, options from Adelaide by air, and there's also ferry services from Cape Jervis, which is the tip of the Fleurieu Peninsula. So an hour and a half drive south of Adelaide to Cape Jervis, check in, and then on the ferry across. So the flight is a, a 25 minute flight. The ferry is about 45 minutes plus your transit time to get down there. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Uh, Peggy, we just have a question. We'll go back to the feral cat thing. Is it After the bushfires, has it been any easier to control the feral cats at all or has it made it actually harder? I won't say that the fires easier to control the cats. Um, they were very good at surviving uh, the blue because uh, they use natural caves and other places to survive. So there's been a lot of cat trapping happening on the western of the island, especially um, where they found um, populations of the kangaroo in Dunart because they are extremely endangered and no one really knows a whole lot about them. So, you know, even post-fire cat trapping in the fire area, I think in a three week period, they trapped around 50 cats. So there's still- Still plenty of them, clearly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, one of the things uh, with the, the cats is uh, all the cats which they've trapped, they've been checking on them and, you know, they've found enormous layers of fat on them. They've been, they're very, very efficient. They've been in very good condition. So, you know, that's, uh, it, it really underscores the need for us to continue to focus on trying to get rid of them. Certainly the opening up of the landscape uh, post fires, last time we had big fires, that was when the opportunity was taken really get stuck into feral cats and feral goats. And both Peggy and I were part of the natural resource board for the island then. And really, you know, we, we worked hard to make sure that that was able to be achieved. And I think that was probably the springboard to say, let's have a really solid crack mm -hmm. at trying mm -hmm. to get onto the cats. So the plan is just to you know, round out the story with this. The plan is to try the east end of the island with the, the Dudley Peninsula. Um, and then if the control techniques or eradication techniques rather are effective on that part, then we'll go further out. But there's certainly been plenty of work being done to keep the numbers low during the, uh, uh, within the fire perimeter. Yeah, I think that's um, great to hear that. I remember seeing some feral cats when I did a project in Outback New South Wales in the Sturt National Park, and they were enormous. I couldn't believe the size of these things. Oh. Um, this is quite extraordinary. So um, that's great to hear that, Craig. Um, I guess we've, since we've been touching on bushfires, we've had quite a few people um, asking how the island is recovering from the bushfires and also what people can do to continue to support the bushfire recovery effort. Do you both like to touch on that, or either of you? Well, I think um, Mike and I keep going down and monitoring in the fire area because we've worked there for, for 50 years. So the natural successions that are happening have really started. And it was amazing to see epicormic shooting, you know, even after a week after the fire. Um, also with, with a lot of the wildlife, uh, my echidnas and goannas, um, they're very good at going underground and digging. We were finding them out foraging, you know, in the in the ash where it was still smoldering. I was able to find some young echidnas emerging from their nursery burrows for the first time when it was still, you know, it was still smoking. So the thing is that it's going to take time. And you know, I, I don't like to talk about, or we don't like to talk about recovery. We like to talk about successions because every plant and every animal species is going to have, it's going to progress at a different um, stage and you know we're not going to have we have what we had that was there for 140 years so that's what people need to understand what we have now is an open book and I think that's pretty exciting and that's that's what people can come and see they can see na nature actually doing what it does naturally because we don't have the things like the the goats and the deer and the and the rabbits that impact on our regeneration I think the other thing people might not realize is that Kangaroo Island is the third largest island. And that means we have rainfall and climatic conditions from semi-arid to temperate rainforest. Mm -hmm. And the fire actually rains through all of those 40 some habitats. <clears throat> and so what is happening 
as far as successions go, is really dynamic. Mm. And in the early days of uh, scientists on Kangaroo Island, <clears throat> they collected some specimens which had not been seen in the last 150 years. And that's most likely because the fire patterns uh, have been there, the natural fire patterns. And so today, what we're uh, expecting is we might see some of these sleeper plants reappearing. And so it's quite exciting for the botanists to think that we have gone through a series of successions which will bring back species that uh, were known from the 1800s and haven't been seen since. That is exciting. And to know that those mm. records are around and the fact that you guys have been doing research so successively for so many years on the island, the data must be incredible. Mm. Yeah, and the uh, repository. Yeah. <laughs> May I ask, uh, may I ask um, Peggy, when we met on the island um, a few years ago, I remember asking you about the echidnas. I I've got a feeling that it wasn't shortly before I arrived that you discovered the um, amount of time it took, takes echidnas to uh, become sexually mature. Yeah. And I think it was around about the amount of time you've been on the island. Um, is that, that, that was the case, wasn't it? And what have you discovered since then? Well, yeah, echidnas... <laughs> are slow to become sexually mature so so it can be you know up to eight years old before they're sexually mature but they do live for 50 years so it's taken a long time to learn about echidnas um what we have done here on kangaroo island because we've been able to gather so much information especially about ferals and road kills and stuff like that and reproduction um the kangaroo island echidna is now li listed as endangered um so, you know, people come to Kangaroo Island to see them, but we call this an incentive animal because you never know where they're going to turn up. They're, they're not an easy animal to work with. You can never promise you're going to see them. But Craig is very good. Um, when people are traveling around the island, um, especially at this time of year, winter is a great time to see echidnas because this is the beginning of the breeding season. So, yeah, we still have a lot to learn about echidnas, but they are survivors. Hmm. Yeah, Craig, would you like to chime in on the um, bushfire succession story? Yeah, look, um, we've we've had a lot of interest in it. And one of the things that through this whole shutdown uh, that we really took the, as uh, my son and I took the opportunity to really say, okay, we've got some time here. We're going to start to do some filmmaking and try and keep in touch with people through doing a series of filming. And actually the, the, the kangaroos behind me, that's part of the uh, filming we did at, at one of the locations. Um, one of them we did on fire recovery. So if you have a look at exceptionalkangarooisland.com forward slash virtual, there's a, uh, a fire recovery piece there where I'm out in the middle of one of the conservation parks, sitting down having a bit of a chat about what does resilient nature look like? How does the fire come back? And then we literally go for a, a bit of a tour through looking at the fungus, the epicormic uh, growth, some of the... Uh, uh, basil growth, the, the little plants that are starting to germinate coming back again. We've had really good opening rains this year and it's been consistent. So look, it's it's remarkable taking a walk through that really open landscape and you're know, looking at a very, very fine scale at all these tiny, tiny plants coming back and some of them now getting big enough that we can actually identify what's coming back. So you know, as Mike suggested, it's really exciting to see well, I haven't seen this here, haven't seen this here. So it's, uh, you know, we, we talk in Australia a lot about nature being resilient, but people actually want to see what does that look like? What does that mean? So that's part of the storytelling now, post fires that we can, that we can share in Kangaroo Island, Gippsland, the, uh, the New South Wales, South Coast, wherever we've had the fires, it's a, it's a great opportunity to really, you know, check in on the on the, the natural reset that, that a fire offers. And people who ask about how they can, you know, assist in a sense with it is basically come and visit the island and learn these things. And, you know, your, your dollars go into the local community and it's incredibly important. So they're open for tourism and it's a real good asset. Absolutely. And, and one of the things, again, where, you know, the, the opportunities that technology offers, things like uh, your apps like uh, iNaturalist, where you can take photographs of, hmm, I haven't seen that fungi before, I haven't seen that plant before. And we're finding that the, the documentation of it through these apps where 
people who might not be particularly knowledgeable, but they're really interested and curious, and they know how to take a photograph, that the app will actually document time, place, dates, um, and get a photograph of it. You put it up, and then suddenly this really, really informed community of, uh, of experts can say, oh, that is Drosera, whatever, uh, and then suddenly you're getting research grade observations coming taken by somebody who is out on a, on a trip or doing a self drive and that then ultimately ends up in the atlas of living australia and becomes accessible to any researchers anywhere so there's actually a subset of those observations being uh, captured for the bushfire recovery so for the first time we, we're getting a pan australia uh, insight into that natural recovery. So that's, I think, again, I'm really positive and try to find ways where we can improve what we do and how we do it out of what's been a pretty challenging time. Yeah, I think technology is such an enabler these days with all of these apps and different things, you know, that we're able to do. It's really quite incredible. So that's really exciting to hear. Um, Peggy, what brought you, well, and Mike, what brought you to Tango Island from far away places? Well, me first. Um, well, when I was an exchange student way back in the 60s and I wanted to come to Australia, there were very few exchanges. So I ended up going to Germany for 20 years. And then I thought, oh, Australia. And, um, and I worked with reptiles and I thought, well, Australia has bigger reptiles. So um, I always wanted to come here. So over 30 years ago, I was on a postdoc and I couldn't get a full postdoc to work with reptiles. So I had half a, half a grant to work with uh, tiger snakes and half a grant to work with echidnas. And I thought, weird enough, I have an egg laying mammal and a life bearing reptile. So that's what brought me here and I'm still here. Fantastic. <laughs> Mike? <laughs> well, I came to work for the Australian government, um, working with the museum. And then I went freelance <clears throat> after I'd completed that contract and for many years uh, roamed the outback, mainly on foot as a wilderness photographer about 10 months of the year. And through working with the publishers and uh, the media, I was uh, asked to come to Kangaroo Island and do a book. And that brought me to the island. And this has been my base ever since. Okay. So Kangaroo Island, as Peggy says, is a biological window into our past. And it's an opportunity to study things in a very unique situation. And that's uh, what's kept me here. And it, does it offer the opportunity for international researchers to come and spend time on, uh, as part of the program? Yes. Or? For the last uh, 30 years, <clears throat> the Pelican Lagoon Research Center has been one of um, a couple of places that people come to. The universities also have uh, areas that they work in, but we've hosted uh, a large group of international researchers, many of whom now have long-term projects. When they started long-term, they defined that as a decade. Mm -hmm. Many of them have learned that the life history of the plant or animal that they're studying will take five or six decades. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's really changed our approach to how we do long-term research. Oh, fantastic. And can I, uh, the other thing, you guys live in a, uh, I also remember living in a, quite a unique house as well. <laughs> oh, well, you know, well, you can't see, you can't quite see our background, but there's some goannas on the wall. Um, you have, but your, your sustainability construct there, I think predates most, most um, uh, water and energy neutral housing in, in, in the world. I think you, you've been, tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Well, in, 2000, <clears throat> there was the World Expo in Hanover, Germany. And Peggy had been uh, lecturing in Germany and she was invited for the research center to actually be a part of the World Expo. And the thing was sustainable living and sustainable research. Because again, as we said, we needed research that could span many decades. And the living, we also felt that we wanted to be able to do it in a uh, exemplary way. So for the decade following the millennium, <clears throat> we hosted uh, people from over 30 different countries that came to actually 
absorb the model and take it back to their home countries and implement it at starting with local levels, but to regional levels and even to national levels. Mm. But directly here, I mean, Mike was using solar power before it was really popular back I was in around the 1970s, 90, the yeah. late 70s, <laughs> and, it, and, it's grown, and it's grown from there. So, you know, and we live in a place with a lot of limestone, so that's what we built with. And I mean, there's a lot of, you know, half of Kangaroo Island, you know, gets their, gets their water from the rain. So we know how precious water is and how important it is to collect it. So I think a lot more people now who are becoming uh, more self-sufficient and, and doing standalone um, housing, you know, as far as water, electricity, um, even recycling. Yeah. Yeah. Kangaroo Island is good at that. <laughs> that limestone is beautiful. I've seen it used in walls and in a lot of places. So, uh, Craig, we've put together a fan view, or you've kindly put together a fabulous itinerary for us to present to our listeners and our database. Um, would you want to touch on, we've touched a bit about the great wildlife opportunities, but maybe talk about some of the other extraordinary things that are available to witness, to experience on Kangaroo Island? Yeah, I, I think um, we've, we've got the opportunity you know, over the course of a week, this is a, a seven-day program, to really touch on, so many elements of island life, island living, whether that's the, the food and wine producers, the farmers, the artists, uh, really connecting with people. Uh, there's some uh, home hosted uh, meals, so you really get to get to talk to locals and getting under the skin. The sorts of things that the typical visitor to Kangaroo Island perhaps might be interested in, but it's not accessible. So really uh, using that opportunity of, uh, of a longer stay to really join the dots and really you know, look a bit under the hood of uh, some of the elements to Kangaroo Island that uh, people might not be aware of. You know, the, you know, the, the quiet little, uh, little corners that, uh, that the locals know about, but uh, aren't, uh, you know, you're not seeing them on, on all the brochures and all the programs. I think that's the unique benefit of travelling on some, um, you know, arranged programs like this instead of, you know, it's great to have self-drive tourism and, and self-discovery, but it's also uh, really rewarding to be uh, on a, a, a tour that's been led by the locals and the professionals and the people that sort of know those things. Yeah, and, and one of the, you know, as, as an example, um, you know, Peggy and Mike would be involved as well. So we would meet up out in the, in the bush and uh, off they go for a walk. Uh, meanwhile, our guides will be uh, preparing lunch and then they'll come back in having sort of got a bit of an insight into what does it take on a daily basis to conduct research and, you know, just that slow, very observant, you know, time spent in, in nature. Um, and then you can enjoy a, a beautiful meal and a nice glass of local wine with Peggy. Um, so it's, it's a social element as well as the education and the immersive um, engagement with that that sense of, of space and you know shared space with nature and climate wise i mean kangaroo island has a quite a temperate climate doesn't it so even in winter it's not too harsh to visit even though the last few weeks we've had some chilly weather i think i think winter is one of the best times on kangaroo island i mean the the uh, the birds are active you know the roos are active all the animals are really active in the winter time mm -hmm. and always tell people who come to work here there's no such thing as bad weather just wrong clothing <laughs> and really floristically we have um, a good show of flowers <clears throat> uh, at least eight months of the year not just in the springtime but because that kangaroo island is so diverse and has so much uh, variation in rainfall from semi-arid to temperate rainforest there's all of these ecological niches interacting continuously. So it, um, winter, <clears throat> a little before winter, a little after winter, basically that comes out eight months of the year when you're going to be seeing all of these things. And then our summer months are amazing because, again, on Kangaroo Island, we have so much native habitat. And in that native habitat, there's a lot more activity than you see on the mainland which um, is often in the interactive, uh, interchanging habitats between people and nature. So here, it's, it's a really good time. Mm. Yeah. 
And Craig, there's also quite a, a few marine-based experiences that people can enjoy when, when we're on the island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's. Um, yeah, I, I think you know, being an island, if you don't get out and see it from the the water, you, you're missing missing part of the picture. Uh, the islands has a an extraordinary diversity. It's it's one of the few areas with north facing coastline at at this latitude on Earth. There's not much in South America and in South uh, South Africa, Southern Africa, um, and not much in Australia because most of it's facing go down south. So we have the Lewin current that comes around, which is driven by the Indonesian through flow up in um, up by by Lombok, that pushes down and actually brings tropical water <coughs> and it, it comes around through the uh, uh, the Australian bite and then tapers off here. And then to the north of Kangaroo Island we've got the two big gulfs. They have relatively slow turnover of water, higher temperature, higher salinity and then the Southern Ocean comes up with the upwellings. So you've got this crazy mixture of warm saline, mm. warmer tropical, and then this really cold stuff coming in from the bottom. And that drives an amazing diversity. So looking around Kangaroo Island under the ocean, there's more biodiversity that's unique here than there is on the thousands of kilometers of the Great Barrier Reef. They've got an enormous abundance of, of animals there, but they don't have the things which are unique. We've got some things like, Mike, your front door out, the Pelican Lagoon, there's, uh, there's animals in there that are found nowhere else on earth. There's just that, 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 that true. endemism is extraordinary. Mm. <clears throat> yes. Uh, but oh, sorry, Mike, <laughs> so The lagoon and the island, as Craig is saying, there's not many places uh, where you can find this diversity mixing all together. And that's what really makes it unique. And it's also good then so many times of the year. I just, I just wanted to add, because I haven't had a chance to talk about this beast behind, but this photo was taken off Portland, but these animals migrate from uh, Indonesia, uh, where the Indonesian through flow current comes through Banda Sea and they migrate to off um, Kangaroo Island. So they're following the Lewin current all the way around Australia and doing that migration every year. So I, I haven't had a chance to, it hasn't related to anywhere so far I've done a webinar on, so it's great to mention. <laughs> but I, had, and I hadn't made the connection with the Lewin current all the way all the way around before either. And Simon, that beast on your wall, is, a, is that a blue whale? That's a blue whale, yeah. And these, I say, these are the very same animals that, that go off Kangaroo Island as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Uh, Craig, accommodation options across the island. There's uh, many and varied, minus one luxury lodge at the moment, which is being rebuilt. <laughs> but Yes, so we've got, um, yeah, there's, there's quite a range from, I guess, the most simple you know, camping. There's, there's campgrounds, there's uh, you know, modest uh, you know, beach shacks, right through to some pretty fancy uh, beach houses, uh, some beautiful places where you can be completely looked after, whether that's a more lodge style or, um, or some private villas as well that have got uh, a fully catered. So, you know, quite, quite a range, about um, formal beds, probably about 14, 1500 at the moment. We did lose some with the, uh, the bushfires with Southern Ocean Lodge and the Wilderness Retreat and uh, Hanson Bay cabins, but uh, yeah, there's still quite a, a range and uh, a lot of those are um, in great locations in terms of, uh, of habitat around. So uh, the program which we've put together, the week-long program, the, the place we've chosen to stay there is the McEwa Kangaroo Island Lodge. And that has glossy black cockatoos nesting up behind. You often hear them in the morning and evening. There's a really good mix of habitats with the, um, the water birds out the front with the uh, very, very protected marine lagoon from Pelican Lagoon, American River out into Eastern Cove. And uh, that has an excellent restaurant, really good food, good focus on local produce. So, uh, you know, we always try to make sure that we're, we're you know, bringing in the hospitality, the storytelling, the, the, you know, the uh, nature, um, and as well as the, the art scene as well. So to try and give people a, a well-rounded uh, experience so they uh, they get to understand why we're so passionate about living where we do and being very fortunate to, to do so yeah 
just touching briefly, Flinders Chase National Park obviously sustained considerable damage down that way. Is it reopened at all to, to guests or is it still closed? It's reopened, just reopened. Uh, it's not open to self-drive yet, but that's not far away. Uh, but the the roads which are reopening are literally just going to be the sealed road in the southwest because there's a, so much infrastructure damage. Yes. The the amount of bush that burned this time was that not that dissimilar to the 07 fires, but what was different this time was the amount of the infrastructure taken out as far as boardwalks, water, power, uh, all sorts of facilities Shelters, through the yeah. park and, and housing as well with the rangers' houses and the uh, information centre. Uh, so what we're doing with, with that end of the island is uh, we've linked up with a a private conservation group, Land for Wildlife. So we're able to access areas outside of the park. So you're able to see, before we go into the park, you can see what did this look like before and what will it look like again in terms of just getting the understanding of that and also understanding how important those little uh, refuges, those little unburned oases are that are within the park and adjacent to the park from which the, the, the repopulation um, has already started to occur with those animals that uh, found a way to escape, um, you know, escape the blaze. Mm. Right. Thank you for that. Well, we've reached our, our, um, our half an hour session. So what I'd like to say is thank you very much to all of you for contributing today. It's been fantastic to listen to you and learn, even for me as a, a South Australian local, even learn more about Kangaroo Island. So it's just a, one of those places a, a must see on everyone's list. And um, we've got our seven day itinerary all together, which Craig's prepared for us, which includes time with Peggy and Mike on their property. Um, and we will get that information out to everybody uh, very soon so that they can uh, come join us and explore Kangaroo Island. So thanks guys, appreciate your time. Thank all you, right. yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. All right, good night.